Welcome to our Brown Bag series brought to you by Headhunt in partnership with NUS Institute of System Science. Broadcasting live from ISS, we have with us Dr. Leong Man Q, Director of Graduate Programs. Dr. Leong will be opening the session and sharing with us on ISS and their programs. I will now pass the time to Dr. Leong. Over to you, Dr. Leong. Thank you, Tammy. Oh, hello, everybody. Uh, let me get my slides going. One of the things we've learned uh, teaching online for the last couple of years is that we have learned to be very patient. So you're probably seeing the wrong screen right now. Let me get, let me just swap that. Okay, so I think you all see my screen. So let me just uh, highlight things because uh, again, we've been teaching online for quite some time now and we're quite used to it actually. So I'm just uh, here to give you kind of an introduction to ISS and also a little bit about stackable programs. Uh, Oh, first of all, I should introduce, my name is Man Q. I am the Director of Graduate Studies. I've been an AI researcher, but I also run the AI program, the data science program, and the software engineering program in ISS. Uh, not so much about myself, but more about ISS. For those of you who don't know what ISS is, uh, we are obviously part of NUS, which as you all should know, is the, uh, one of the top universities in the world. And uh, we are, however, different uh, from, a from the typical departments in NUS because we are very much focused on practice-based education. We are a continuing education institute, but very much about practice-based education. So our major milestones over the last uh, 40 years, we have been around for 40 years, uh, is that we started off uh, really uh, involved in the change uh, of, of Singapore in this computerization journey. And in that picture there, you'll probably see a few ministers you know, uh, Go Chok Tong, uh, a couple of other ministers are there uh, from the 1980s where we were teaching everybody how to be the civil service to become computerized. And then uh, in 96, we launched many of these master's programs, which you can see, uh, including the ones that, uh, that you may be familiar with, our master of technology in software engineering, in intelligence systems, and in enterprise business analytics. Uh, we're also very strong in industry certifications. And a few years back, we were partners together with IDA and the LKY School Public Policy in e-government leadership centers, where we actually do teach leadership to, to uh, senior, senior uh, public servants from many countries around the world. And we got involved in the skills future movement, skills frameworks or ICT and so on. And kind of around the line about 50% of their, of their causes in, in when they first launched are all ISS causes. Uh, we are very much involved in smart health as well. One of those areas where Singapore definitely punches above our weight. And then we uh, embarked a couple of years back as well, a few years back as well into multiple uh, learning pathways. I'll mention a little bit more about this when we talk about stackables. And then we move into industry 4.0 skills future, the smart nation. And of course, what we're talking about today is about stackable programs, which we launched in 20, uh, 2017, 2018. Although if you, if, you know, if you know the slow process of approvals by universities and MOE, uh, we conceived this about seven years back, right? Just took a little bit of time to get many of these things going. So the idea behind stackable is that we really are providing alternate pathways. So a typical graduate program, that's the one you see here where you, where you uh, enroll for a master's program or a graduate diploma, and then you spend uh, one year with us uh, full-time or two years with us part-time and get a degree. That's fairly traditional, but it's not suitable for everybody. So we also have what we've called the stackable programs, which are a different pathway to the same uh, uh, endpoint, right? Still the same degrees, but really about giving people more flexibility, a different option, and also admitting people who, in many cases, may not uh, satisfy the minimum requirements that are uh, that are typically applied to enter a master's program. But there's no reason why, if you just don't look like um, uh, a typical um, uh, applicant that we can't give you the opportunities. The, the, the prevailing model in many cases is that you need a very strong um, input to get a strong output. 
right? But that's not necessarily the case. We are becoming more inclusive, creating more of a funnel that we let many people in, but if they work hard, they will successfully uh, succeed, right? But if they are not suitable or they don't, or you don't in many cases, work really, uh, take the initiative and study for yourself, then uh, there are strong, um, there are strong gateways that will, uh, that will ensure the quality of all the graduates from this program, right? So we are here today really literally about explaining what the stackable uh, program is, how it stacks to the master's degree. And of course, uh, something all of you are very, it's important to all of you, uh, we do give subsidies for Singaporeans and SPRs, right? So essentially, the most important thing to remember is that all our programs, and we talk about the stackable programs, they comprise graduate certificates. And each grad cert is modular and stackable. Modular means, modular means that it addresses a core set of complementary skills for a specific industrial job role. In other words, what we do is that we look at what industry needs, and then we craft programs that address a skill. Right, And of course, what I said was stackable, you take it on time, on target, and then you can stack it up to end up with the MTech or the grad tip. The grad cells are also what we call minimum viable products. For those of you who are familiar with the new, those terminologies, it's from software, engine, it's from software right? You build the, the minimum you need to get a job done. You don't, add, you don't pad it to make it bigger. Right, then you don't miss out anything that's not important. That's important. So we are not fixed to a number of courses or modular credits. If it's a small program, it's smaller. If it's a big program, it's bigger, right? And that's because uh, that's what you need, and we give you exactly what you need to be able to do a job, right? We recognize prior learning, so we it is not something that says you must always have uh, this piece of paper. It's more. Do you have the experience? Are you able to do the job? And we do that while maintaining that a more, as I said earlier, a more inclusive input, as long as there is very high, you can cross the bar, right? To get out of the program, it does ensure the quality learning outcomes that all programs need. All right, so the grad cert structure kind of looks like this. Don't worry too much about the words, right? So the pictures at the side in here. Uh, programs uh, comprise uh, three to four in most cases. Uh, as I said, the minimum viable products, right? Of different sizes, three days, four days, five days, six days. Uh, and these courses can be taken in any order as long as you fulfill the prereqs, right? So the prerequisites. But within the prerequisites, you can take them in any order. So there's a lot of flexibility. Together with that, we expect students to actually practice, right? The practice part. Uh, and that's the important part of practice-based education. Not just take a course and then you know forget about it until the exam comes along. You're expected to practice. And we talk about it like playing uh, playing football. If you come and learn how to play football with us, right? We'll teach you how to kick the ball. But it really means you have to go home, get your own football, and kick the ball ten thousand times in your back garden, and preferably get all your neighbors to come and kick the ball with you. That's the only way you're going to get some skill in kicking the football. Right? Same thing with anything you learn. It's practice, practice, and practice. And that's very important. Whether you practice at home or practice in your day job, right? That's also important. Right. That then leads to again, uh, after taking the courses, after you practice yourself, we, you will then do an assessment piece. This is the very, very tough, as I said, uh, competency gateway that ensures that you that, that you that you uh, satisfy the requirements for a graduate certificate, right? And the graduate certificate is, uh, is that piece of paper or that qualification that actually says you're suitable and you have the skills to do a particular industry job role. Uh, the gateway comprises a practice module and a practice module exam, right? So you have to actually do a project, project module, right? You have to do a, a real world project as well as take an exam, okay? And let me give an example. This is our uh, stackable masters of technology in software engineering, okay? And it comprises um, a mandatory grad cert. So what, what we do here is we divide things into fundamentals and then specialists. And they're either one or two, one or two uh, uh, fundamental grad certs and they are all mandatory. And then you have to take two um, specialist grad certs out of the four options here. Right? So you take one here, 
and you take two of the four specialist grad certs. If you, if you complete all of these grad certs, right, and you do well in them, then you sign up and matriculate at that point to do the final MTech uh, capstone program, right? And if you do that, you will then, uh, and you, of course, you have to get the minimum requirements in every case, uh, you will graduate with the MTech, all right? So uh, full time, our normal full time true train students take a year. The part time students take two years. Stackable students have the flexibility to take courses in in different order and over a longer period of time, and can take up to seven years from when they from their first grad cert to actually complete. Okay. Um, that was, this is for software engineering, which I just showed you. This is similar for data science. I said that you have to do two foundational grad certs and then two out of four of these here, right? Two out of four. Okay, and that's for data science and that's for arti AI, artificial intelligence. Same thing, you do both of this, right? And then two out of four of these as well. And all of this, of course, information is on our website if you want to, to find out more information about that. And that's the same software engineering degree, smart systems and platforms. Students who, who have taken the grad certs can also move from the, from the stackable pathway into the, into the proper or the true train uh, mechanism as well. And we call it matriculation. You matriculate into the MTech, right? You can do it obviously after completing all the grad certs right, and me meeting the requirement uh, uh, grade point average, right, uh, in addition to all other NUSS uh, requirements, as well as, of course, uh, along the way, you can also do it along the way, all right. Uh, so these are easy, you finish all the grad certs, you want to go and do the, you want to uh, come in and do the, the capstone, that's possible. That's the, in fact, the normal pathway. You can also come in uh, halfway. If you do very well, then you can come in uh, along uh, halfway through the, the program. We will also accept you, but you will be competing against all the other applicants in the cohort, right? And if you're not doing so well, you can still continue along the stackable pathway and improve your overall performance uh, to just to, to ensure that you have a longer runway to get through the system, okay? Um, and of course, if you do have special circumstances, as I said, we do recognize prior learning and so on that are not part of the NUS requirements. That also is a possible thing, but you will do this only after finishing all the grad certs. So a common question that our applicants ask us is, is this stackable route right for me? I mean, should I be doing this? And uh, the answer that we always have is that there's no right path or wrong path, they're always different path ending at the same destination, which is the same degree, right? We are very much practice-based uh, approach to learning, right? Uh, our part-time true trained students work and study at the same time. And I said earlier, they practice. The full-time students get their work experience through an internship. And if you join us on a stackable journey, you have the most flexibility. Right. The pace of learning is tied to the time and effort that you can commit and also the practice that you can do. Right? And as I said earlier, uh, understanding, for example, data science, right? it's not just the textbooks and so on. It's all about the practice, the practice, and the practice. Okay. So uh, the other question that many people ask is that I prefer the true train pathway. Uh, yes, and we do agree that, that that is one very valid pathway that's tried and true. But we also have many students who have different entry points, uh, people who have different levels of prior learning, uh, different degrees before joining the learning journey. So sometimes they don't always have the right uh, background to embark on a short one-year program or even a part-time two-year program. So the stackable pathway allows for this greater inclusivity. We let people for less experience, less relevant backgrounds. And you know, some of you, some, some of them who, some of you who have maybe haven't done an exam in 20 years, uh, come back and take a longer pathway to get a, a new degree and continue to, to up, uh, upskill your, 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 your skills, right? So it's always an opportunity to take a different but equally valid pathway, right? And we, we do have students who don't finish this journey. That's important, right? Uh, it's an opportunity to start the journey, no guarantees that you will finish it. But if you try really hard, right, and practice, you have many opportunities to actually 
uh, get through it. It may take you longer, right? You may take a different path. It may take you shorter sometimes, but uh, you you will uh, end up uh, on an equally valid path. And we have students who, even though they don't make it all the way, every grad cert that they've earned is a recognition of what you have accomplished. And it does give you opportunities for a new job. All right. And lastly, I did uh, promise to tell you that we have subsidies. So um, the normal fees, the normal full fees are for all international students have to pay full fees. Uh, Singapore citizens will get 40% support uh, for each graduate certificate uh, with some, with some uh, little bits here and there prorating and PRs will get 20% support. All right, so uh, I rushed through that quite a fair bit. Um, so let me let me um, uh, pass this over now to Brandon to actually uh, talk a little bit more about the uh, data science, and then we'll come back at the end of this uh, session, uh, where I will then we can answer questions about the stackable journey itself. All right, thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Leung. We will now continue with our brown bag session on data storytelling, the essential skills, brought to you by Mr. Brandon Ng from ISS. Before I hand over the time to our speaker, please note that there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, so please feel free to type in your questions at any time during the presentation. We'll also be conducting our feedback poll at the end of the session. Without further ado, I'll now pass the time to Brandon. Over to you, Brandon. Thanks, Demi. Hi, I'm Brandon Ng from NUS ISS under Data Science Practice. Data storytelling, the essential skills. Once again, Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to all of you. Thanks for joining us for this session. Data visualization and storytelling becomes the most essential skill set that everyone should be equipped with. It is about application of established storytelling framework for professionals in carrying out data visualization and storytelling. The key takeaways, in one hour or so, we would like to cover the most important essential steps for today, which are the right choice of charts or graphs, particularly bar graph, line graph, or Joe's Marshall map. The most important key ingredients for storytelling, which are font type to be used to form the text, as well as colors. Also, it is important for us to achieve the right details for business intelligence and analytics. With all of the above, visual guide or visual hierarchy can be achieved to improve viewers' reading patterns in analyzing the presented insights. Obviously, last but not least is the optimal data storytelling mechanisms, which are storyboarding and dashboarding. Okay, some background pertaining to data storytelling. In data and analytics perspective, what are the most important for us to see are basically the superficial of data set, which may not necessarily what are we going to get as the analytics output. Hence, over the time, the industry is moving from highest paid personnel's opinion, in short, people, to data-driven decision-making process. With data and analytics for science, data science space, decision science, for example, is carried out via different analytics techniques. Typically, data is used for exploration and confirmation of certain occurrences. The output of insights will be used for explanation. So there's two major part of it, exploratory versus explanatory. Now, assuming that there are two staffs in an organization, staff one and staff two, as labeled in the diagram. Staff one, for example, always worked very hard over the past one year, worked very hard for the project implementation, and etc. On the other hand, staff two, maybe the team lead, better in presentation, the project achievement and present to the top management. The presentation only takes about 10 minutes. 
Who do you think will get higher year-end bonus? Of course, staff one with the higher contribution, with more in-depth of knowledge and substance for the project being implemented. This to illustrate to us how important is the explanation on top of exploration. With that, there are three main components for data storytelling, namely data, visualization, and storytelling. In this case, in terms of narrative. In nutshell, data stories are unique set of data compositions that blend data, narrative, and visuals in the most effective manner to help in terms of explain, enlighten, and engage your target audience. Nowadays, data become the new ORI for an organization. It is treated as a valuable asset in an organization. You may heard of data monetization as one of the data strategy for organizational excellence journey, including digital transformation. Second component is visualization. Data is represented with different visualization techniques, such as charting, graphing, mapping, or even tabling of data in order to present the insights. Ladies and gentlemen, majority of us are tend to be visual learner or pattern seeker. The common mistake in industry particularly is that we show the entire data set in graphical format. This is really what we have done so far using Excel. So in this case, the most important key takeaway is the three main key visualization techniques, which are bar graph, line graph, and your buffer map, which I'm going to explain later on. Before that, look at this diagram. In fact, there are eight types of charts and graphs are used in this diagram to illustrate the sunset scenery. You may take about 20 seconds from now to identify the type of charts and graphs. Let me repeat, the hint is eight types of charts or graph, not number of charts or graphs. You may take down, take note of what you have identified so far. For the interest of time, let's move on to see the answer. Now, as per label in this diagram, you can see that bubble plot is being used to illustrate the cloud, followed by line graph meant for the flying bird, bar graph is meant for tall buildings followed by symmetric bar chart to illustrate the shadow of the sunset. Pie chart is to illustrate the sunset. Area chart meant for the mountain. Histogram meant for the nearer building. And last but not least, 100% step bar graph is meant for the entire sea. Now, obviously, are we supposed to use all the available types of charts or graph in our presentation or dashboard creation? The answer is big no. We are supposed to help the user to understand the insights rather than to demonstrate our knowledge pertaining to all the available charts or graphs. So with this, bar graphs is highly recommended to present the heavy weightage or score of each discrete data. This is the most effective in answering the question of what, which, who, why, how, whose, and etc. 
The second one, it is useful for us to connect the dots over the time to present the trend and pattern. In this case, time series data are in continuous format. With that, it is effective to answer the when question. Ladies and gentlemen, worth to take note that time series can be in discrete format as well, particularly for aggregated data points. Third, those partial map is used to empower the locational information. Obviously, it is effective in answering the where questions. So this is the graphing and charting techniques being introduced as the most critical, essential, and effective charting techniques. Third component in data storytelling is storytelling, which is narrative. Honestly, human heal statistics, but we may forget in the next nanosecond. But we feel for the stories in terms of verbal narrative or textual description. When we see numbers, we may forget the next moment. However, if there is a visual to capture our attention and with compelling story, the outcome can be very, very significant. In business intelligence implementation and data warehousing for data capturing as effective communication channel, there are always the five rights to be attention to. We are here to present the right information to the right person at the right time with the right quantity and right quality of your information at the right place. In this case, particularly the information is meant for insights presentation. With that, as we know, there are all of ingredients involved in our presentation, dashboard creation, and etc. For today's session, I would like to focus on two main ingredients to improve your data storytelling via visualization. First, it is text to be used. As you know, text is useful to substitute verbal narrative or to highlight the key insights. Text is important to form words for title and notation and label in our visualization. Typically in corporate world, the ideal choice could be corporate font type or typeface. There are some cases we may need to opt for supplementary font type. You may read this text for next 10 seconds or so, is to demonstrate the cognitive science, how fast we can process text by reading through. You will be surprised that you manage to read through the entire paragraph without any issue, unless we are having language barrier. Congratulations, you are absolutely normal. Without any difficulty, it can read the text. Hence, don't underestimate our brain processing the complex information. However, ladies and gentlemen, as a working professional in corporate world, can I assume that all of us are reporting to a very smart or genius reporting manager? Anyone disagree, you can type in the chat box, but make sure your reporting officer is not in this session as well. Okay, joke aside, as you know, super smart, very, very smart people tend to have some kind of reading difficulties. We call it as dyslexia. From scientific design perspective, we may need to consider typeface for dyslexia. Who knows your target audience may struggle with stroke dyslexia, especially when you are doing boardroom presentation for the top management. Worth take note in terms of the font type to be used 
in your presentation and dashboarding. As example, graph should be accompanied with key points in order to improve the presented, presented insights with readable readability of the text as well. From scientific design perspective, second component worth to take note is color. From artistic design perspective, color theory or color view is used for reference of color combination, particularly to derive the corporate color for corporate logo, corporate presentation template, and etc. This is purely from artistic design perspective. Moreover, some of the corporate color are chosen based on color psychology, the meaning behind the scene. As a quick example, colors are used for branding purposes. Also, color do have its meaning. From universal design perspective, green in this case, for example, is due to the issue with for reforest, forest uh, restoration. On the other hand, red color due to the severity critical issue, in this case, referring to COVID-19 impact on tourism. Now, from scientific design perspective, Color is relative to viewer. It is not absolute value. In other words, it is subjective. This is why I call this as color perception. Okay, so from this, as a quick test for everyone, look at the shoe. As an example, material earth will see that it is in pink and white colors. However, minority of us will disagree because we feel that it is so obvious the shoe is in gray and light green. In fact, I do have some participants or students mention to me they see light blue color as well. Now, what's the issue with this? This to demonstrate to us Color is not absolute. Individual will see color based on their perception. Now, the answer is, the actual fact is that on the left, the shoe, the picture is being edited using software by adding additional color pigment to act as a noise. On the right, it is the original photo which is absolutely, absolutely in pink and white color. So minority of us, including myself, we see the color of the shoe is in gray and light green because we fail to filter the noise, causing that we see the distorted color. Don't be alarmed. We still can keep our job. It is a minor issue with the color. Now with the situation here, the key takeaway is that we try to avoid, or in fact, we avoid rainbow color scheme from now onwards. In fact, it is obsolete, obsolete way too long. So we put in museum in that case. Right, so no more rainbow color to be used in your presentation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure that some of you are reporting to male reporting officer again, or even there are a lot of male top management in your organization. But do you know about eight to 10% of male is having certain level of color vision deficiency or even color blindness? Means whatever you see the color is different from what they view. As an example, it is noticed that for the common color vision deficiency group, as shown in the red box, they're not able to differentiate between the green and red colors. Please allow me to repeat. This group of people not able to differentiate between red and green color. However, based on the three different groups of color vision deficiency, all of them can differentiate between 
blue and orange colors to a certain extent. Unfortunately, for those are total color blindness, they only can see the tone of color from black and gray to white. So what's the key takeaway? To further illustrate this, in fact, traffic light color is a serious mistake done by human in this earth because it is creating a lot of dangerous situation for the traffic. So if possible, try to avoid traffic light color, especially those are involved in project management using traffic light color to indicate your project progress status. I'm sure before the project call meeting, we try to convert all the amber or orange to green and change some of the red to orange so that it doesn't look bad for our project progress. However, do you take into consideration of this color vision deficiency issue? Who knows, they are, may have one of your key tech stakeholders who is not able to differentiate the colors coding. With that, from red to green, we to move on to orange and blue colors. So these are some of the examples of skill using the red and green to differentiate between the yes and no, positive and negative, increment, decrement, and etc. However, moving forward, by putting in all the best practices for data, visualization, and storytelling using color and text, it is useful and helpful to improve our insights presentation. How to remember this? Remember NUS and NUS ISS corporate color. In color view, blue and orange colors are directly opposite. In design world, they are always used or considered as complementary colors. Hence, they're always used as a color combination for corporate world. This is from artistic design perspective. On the other hand, as we discussed just now, from scientific design perspective, blue and orange combination is friendly for color vision deficiency people. So for easy reference, once again, always remember NUS and ISS corporate colors, which are in blue and orange. The best color combination to be used in your data visualization for effective presentation. So some of the example, you will notice that in data journal articles, for example, Gartner publication, some of the corporate annual reports, which adhere strictly to the best practices, they are only presented using four colors, namely black for important information, gray, for background information. You may ask why gray color for in background information. Always remember, it is a good practice to set the right context prior to present your content. Context before content. Last but not least, orange and blue color as highlighting color to improve insights presentation. So in this example of insights presentation with bar graph to answer what, which, why, how, who, and etc. as the key business questions. Second, as highly recommended, insights presentation with line graph to answer the when questions with some of the key important message plus analytics presentation. Third, insights presentation with Joe's partial map to answer the where questions with the right colors for encoding to highlight the insights. As you can see, the default setting for bar graph created in Microsoft Excel is what I name it as malnutrition bar. The gap is wider than the bar. In fact, it is contrast with the original principle of graph, bar graph creation. Bar graph is to carry the weightage of each discrete data. Hence, the gap should be smaller than 
the bond. Another example, if possible, ladies and gentlemen, we should try to avoid pie chart. However, in your organization, if pie chart is the most favorite type of charts to be used, we should try to improve it by using the sorting, tone of color, and etc. With all the key ingredient, key important best practices in data visualization, we can compose together to form the most optimal data storage mechanism to carry out possessive presentation using storyboard. Now in layman terms, we always refer this as presentation flow in presentation session using Microsoft PowerPoint. Now it is no issue for us to read a text in the paragraphing method from top left to bottom right. However, data visual is considered as a graphical presentation which lead to randomized viewing pattern by the target audience. Proper use of color and text will create visual hierarchy as the important guide for viewing pattern. This includes choice of colors, tone of colors, font type, font size, and etc. So to give some example, this is example of storyboard for possessive presentation using Tableau. In fact, it is done by my previous master degree students as the team project. Next, another example, storyboarding for possessive presentation. The second data storytelling mechanism is dashboard. It is another important optimal data storytelling framework to be used for effective communication of insights. Recall earlier slides, reading a paragraph is kind of viewing individual graph, chart, table, or map. For this case, reading a, an essay, it is equivalent to viewing multiple graphs in one glance. Hence, dashboard design and layout is the crucial factor. So that we're able to guide your viewer, your target audience, to grab the most critical, essential information from your analytics output. This is an example of dashboard done by my student. Map, bar graph, line graph on the top section to answer the most critical business problem statement of when, what, and where. When for capital trend. Another example of dashboard implementation using Tableau. At the same time, in this case, the most critical information will be in continuous time series information followed by bar graph and the map. With that, I have concluded the most essential skills using data visualization for storytelling in terms of analytics output presentation from explanatory, confirmatory to finally explanatory. That's all I would like to share for this session. Maybe I go to the Q&A session. Ladies and gentlemen, if there are any issue, you can put in your chat box for us to answer accordingly. Okay, there's a very good question. So I'll answer. The question is, why you discourage presenting using a pie chart, please? Now, the issue is that when you want to compare the category data, product A and product B, right? So using bar graph, assuming that in the norm situation, you want to compare the height between you and your sibling, you should stand side by side. We are not asking them to squat down and compare their height. 
But you are doing this when we convert the height, the scoring of the bar into angle. With the angle, it's hard for us to compare the proportion of each of them. The crucial part is here is that pie chart is famous for part of whole. I can see the totality. But we're coming to comparing individual product group, individual category data, it's best for us to put them on the same baseline, do a line as a benchmarking to compare their height, which is their scoring. Hope this will answer the question in terms of pie chart versus the bar graph. Another question. Am I right to say that type of charts depends on the type of data? Absolutely. Data is a raw data, meaningless, until we put them into a proper visual manner. Let's take an example. Data need to be dressed up, which is represented using charts and present using charting, graphing, mapping, or tabling. What we have done so far, especially in Excel, we just choose, select the row and the column, and we convert it in charts or graph. In other words, we're showing your data in slightly different manner in graphical form, but yet we are still showing the raw data. We are not helping your user, your target audience, to highlight the most critical insights for presentation. When you choose the right type of charts or graph, insert additional benchmarking, color coding, and notation. As mentioned, color and text is the most critical issue. It will help us to bring your insights presentation to the next level. Hope this answer your question. Another question, if we have a lot of bar graphs because we have a lot of comparison to perform, now it really depends on how, to what extent you want to present. Uh, if you're talking about a design as a dashboard, particularly from the layout itself, there is a first introduced uh, to the context with introduction. And it is, can be a real overview pertaining to the information followed by the body, the climax and the conclusion. The conclusion tend to be future locking trend patterns with forecasted information to help your end user, your target audience, your top management to make decision there and then so that we feed them with information at their fingertips. However, if there is a lot of graph to be presented, think through, is it supposed to be have different dashboard, different set of presentation, via storyboarding because they tend to be targeted at different target audience, right? So in other words, we can't get the one piece of science to fit your entire organizational users. It need to be targeted, to be designed appropriately meant for their job scope. Let me repeat, in business intelligence and analytics, we're always referring to five rights, the right info, to the right person at the right time with the right quality and quantity at the right place. If you're doing a boardroom meeting setting, it's very different for you to do your team building. It's very different from management retreat and etc. Next question. So we separate a dashboard into several figures to avoid too much information at the same time. Absolutely, you are right because if you are having a very targeted dashboard based on the target audience from the job rule, be it different functional area from sales and marketing, 
human resource, IT, and etc. versus the rank of their job scope from strategic to tactical to operational. Now with that situation, it is a very targeted dashboard to be created for their usage, for their day-to-day -day ops, periodical, periodical review, and etc. So with the information, usually the case in the dashboard creation, we will suggest at most five questions, five critical business questions to be answered. And these five questions can be answered with five to eight as a maximum for our graph or charts. So in other words, to avoid overwhelming information, we should stick to at most eight charts or graph available, available in a typical dashboard design. Now this is based on the psychology research way, based on our cognitive load, short-term memory, working, working memory, we only can hold up to eight pieces of information. Right, so in fact, if having eight charts, in fact, is considered information overload for your end user who see your dashboard for the very first time. Okay, next question. Is there a trend for how important is programming in data science? Is there towards application that remove need? Uh, yes and no, depends on your job scope. Uh, in, in industry, people try to create a role called citizen data scientist, where you can make use of soft, uh, a package or tools to create the output. In this case, for our today's topic, data storytelling, in fact, it can create a very, very intensive, attractive, yet adhere to the analytics output using Microsoft Power BI, ClickSense, ClickView, and on the other hand, Tableau as well. Now, it can achieve all the basic necessity, all the functionality can be achieved accordingly. However, if you want to push the limit of the software to improve the customization, to some extent, then programming, scripting is required. Within R or Python, and then to be embedded in the business intelligence tools. So this one the approach for our topics for today. Any free data visualization software recommended for beginners? Yes. Up to now, Microsoft Power BI desktop version is still free for everyone for personal usage. As long as you don't use it for commercial and your enterprise and your organization, it's totally free. Microsoft. Power BI desktop. For Tableau, you may try Tableau public. But one catch is that for Tableau public, you should not use any sensitive or commercial data set because Tableau public requests you to save the software by publishing to the Tableau cloud platform. It is meant for community sharing. So these are the two examples always used based on our training, based on the industry needs. Typically, companies are still struggling between the two, right? So eventually, uh, it is good to pick up the two skill set from two different platforms, yet adhere to the best practices of data, visualization, and storytelling. Okay, another question. If traffic light color scheme should be avoided, what would be the good color scheme to indicate the rise, drop, trend, or good or bad comparison? Always remember NUS, ISS logo, blue and orange. Blue color is cool color, tend to closer to blue uh, green. Orange warm color, closer to red. Now, there are cases where a lot of participants, a lot of industry practitioners, they still want to stick to the corporate color. As long as you don't have the combination of green and red together in a piece of presentation, I think it is fine. For example, 
If your copper color is in red, you can use red, orange, and blue color. If your copper color is in green color, you can use green, blue, and orange. All right, so green in this case is a lighter, reduced the intensity compared to blue color. Similarly, orange to red is increase of intensity. So you can try to find, to try the balance between your corporate color usage versus the color vision deficiency as a user-friendly presentation format. Is there a specific course in Tableau in ISS? Okay, in, in ISS, we have executive, executive education program for data storytelling. It is a three-day course where I share the keys, the, the most important critical key component within uh, uh, one hour or so. But in fact, it is three days course itself. Typically for public run, we will use Tableau. Right? So we are not teaching Tableau per se as a tool, but we try to use a software, Excel, PowerPoint, and Tableau to demonstrate your essential skills in terms of presentation via storyboarding, insights presentation, using dashboarding. And in fact, we're also covering the uh, publicity of the information of a corporate via annual report, campaign awareness, banner, poster creation via infographics design as well. Okay, maybe another question. What is the difference between Excel versus the Tableau to dashboard? In fact, Tableau, Power BI, all this is considered as business intelligence tools where there is a mechanism built in to process the data, to do the visualization, be it individual charting or graphing, followed by dashboard creation, and last but not least, presentation. Which means once you upload the data into this BI tools as a platform, you are doing everything under one pipeline. From data preparation, presentation, and dashboarding. In other words, we can throw away all the Excel, PowerPoint, and et cetera. So that everything will be under one platform, improve the reporting, it will improve the dashboard creation, improve the individual presentation as well under one platform. Okay, so in a lot of industry practices, they try to migrate everything into one platform from Power BI desktop for creation, for reading, all the way to Power BI Cloud, where all the user can do self-help access to the report, to the near real-time situation. Another interesting topic, why chosen black color is presented important message instead of red? Red, I would assume that in this context, it's orange and blue color is used for highlighting color. We should use the color sparingly. Otherwise, it's way too eye-catching that you will reverse, have re having reverse effect. You will not be able to highlight the most essential or critical information. So assuming that you're reading a textbook, all the textbooks are printed in black toner. When you want to highlight the key information, you use a green, yellow color of highlighters to highlight it. Similar in this case, red color should be reduced in terms of the usage because it's way too eye-catching. Red, in fact, is used to be too loud, right? So jokes aside is to scold people via email using red color, right? So you can see the how loud is the text if you're using the red color in that sense. Okay, an interesting question. When would it be appropriate to use bubble plot? Bubble plot, pie chart, donut chart, Tree map, all the fanciful appearance should be used for another paradigm, which is infographics, 
Now, for today's session, I'm focusing pretty much on professional presentation in a serious presentation setting, be it boardroom meeting, be it dashboard creation for top management usage, and etc. On the other hand, when you have all this information for campaign awareness to present your company's financial health status to the stakeholders in the annual report, or in fact, there are some data journalism to be appear in the magazine published by your organization, then it's meant for making use of infographics. Now, infographics meant for us to dilute the heavy information, or in other words, we call it as lightweight, fun, memorable, cater for the mass of the public. The public not to know the details, but more importantly, treat as a very, very light version of fun and memorable output of the insights. So you can see that in fact, these are two different paradigms of data visualization from professional corporate environment to the public meant for lightweight information. As I mentioned just now, what alternative software for Tableau and Dashboard? It really depends on the company, depends on which software your company would like to embark on. For example, Google Data Studio, ClickView. Uh, of course, Power BI and Tableau is recently the most uh, competitive one in the industry. There, there is a lot, but it really depends on the companies what they want to, to achieve, you see. So some the company, they really go push for the open source by making use of uh, even our programming, our shiny dash uh, Python using dash, for example, to create a dashboard, uh, customer build accordingly from scratch, right? If these are the companies are having a very technically strong team to develop from scratch, yet not tied to any licensing issue, right? So on the other hand, there's a lot of software available in industry. The, the top three one will be Click, Tableau, and Power BI by Microsoft. Maybe I'll take the last one question. In this case, how much stats math ground required for data science? A good question. Uh, in, in terms of data science, there's a wide spectrum, right? This domain, as you need to know the knowledge so they can answer the question. Uh, on the other hand, programming, where you need to know the logical thinking, a logical uh, processing of the flow so they can code it in the programming method. And obviously the last one is the statistics. Depends on the situation, statistics or mathematics in general, or more detail if you want to work on the uh, predictive analytics, obviously require advanced statistics. And you want to work on the optimization of prescriptive analytics, then sometimes you require AI techniques as well as operational research techniques as well. I think that's all for me. Yeah. Uh, well thanks for sharing, uh, joining me for this session. Now I should hand over to Dr. Leong for any question pertaining to the program. Thanks. Thank you, Brandon. Thanks, guys. Wasn't it a great talk by Brandon? So uh, we've come back to the, the, the same thing that we did at the beginning of the session. So this, is all, this program is not just for you to learn about data storytelling. As Brandon said, we have a three-day uh, course that does this. Uh, we also have a couple of courses for statistics, uh, stats for bootcamp and uh, stats, uh, sorry, stats bootcamp and stats for business. Uh, stats bootcamp is more hardcore and R. Uh, stats for business is really the minimum or essential parts of statistics that you need to know to really become a, a decent uh, uh, data scientist, uh, kind of citizen data scientist as, as Brandon called it. Uh, 
So uh, I'm, I'm here more or less to take some questions if anybody has about the stackable programs. Uh, it is an alternative pathway to the Masters of Technology. More importantly, it is also a way of uh, a structured method to, to pick up uh, new skills for the program for, your, for yourselves as well. So I didn't mention it earlier, but every one of the vertical columns in my description um, just now was is a grad cert. And each of these grad certs is a sequence of causes. And this sequence of causes is the minimum requirement to learn a job, job, uh, job role. Uh, I think in the past, we all got a little bit used to, I take one course, I gain one skill, right? In this, you know, that, that kind of an idea. Uh, today, we are in a really deep tech, deep tech world, and uh, it's no longer one course, one skill. To, be, to, to have some idea of how to actually work with data well, you have to go through a sequence of causes. And, as I, and also, as I said, you have to practice, practice, and practice. Right, so um, in that sense, uh, the grad certs are designed to do to do that for you. And for since we are talking about, I think most of you here are interested in data science. Uh, our first data science grad cert uh, is analytics project management and data storytelling. The program, the course, is actually part of this grad cert. The uh, APM grad cert, analytics uh, project management grad cert, is really designed for creating the job skill for uh, people who are responsible for delivering a data science project, right? Primarily around visualization. So this entire grad cert is done in Excel, right? It, it's open to anybody. You don't need any specialized skills. You don't need to know programming. You don't need to know anything, just how to use Excel. And it starts with uh, stats for business. I mentioned earlier the minimum kind of statistics you need to actually be able to tell a good story. That's, for example, um, uh, statistically valid when you tell the story. And then goes on to data storytelling. And then we go on to data management. This data management is basically uh, when you do a project, when you don't do a data science project, even a small one, a, a data storytelling project, you have to pull the data from somewhere, right? It's not, it's not magically given to you. So you have to learn some uh, what we call SQL, Structured Query Language uh, SQL, uh, to actually pull the data from a database or else you use uh, some kind of uh, ODBC, JDBC, uh, pull from Excel, other Excel spreadsheets, combine them together to create your, your fundamental data set. Uh, the other issues about data, of course, is that you need to clean your data. In many cases, people have uh, 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 different ways of putting the same thing, right? We all know that, you write your name, uh, you can see your name comes down in five or six different ways, right? Uh, in in uh, When you write it down. And, um, you have used initials, you have a title, no title, things like this. So you have to clean it to make it so that you can actually say it's the same person each time, normalize the data, uh, data cleansing in general. And then uh, be able to put the data when, for example, it comes from multiple databases or multiple spreadsheets, you want to either combine it or bring it together in a way that makes sense normalize the data and so on. In some cases, say you're collecting data from two sources. In one, in one case, that data is updated on a daily basis. In the other case, you update it on a monthly basis. And then you, you don't actually have the same number of rows in the data, right? One of them is on a monthly basis, one's on a daily basis, the number of rows are different. How do you merge this kind of data? So that will be in that, center, in that part of it. And then the last course in this uh, grad cert is analytics project management. It's literally a, a project management course, PM course, uh, but uh, designed for people who have to manage and deliver uh, the, an analytics project. So that those four causes uh, comprise the component modules for this grad cert in um, APM, as we call it, right? And APM is analytics project management. Um, so that's just that. And then of course, as I, I should at the beginning, you have to take a, a practice module, which is an exam and then do a project, right? In this case, the project will almost certainly be some form of a data storing project where you have to demonstrate the ability to pull the data and then uh, manage the project as well as to give a very, very compelling, not just sensible, but compelling story uh, supported by your data.
And you know, if, if any of us have been following the COVID crisis for the last year, a couple of years, uh, the kind of infographics coming up about COVID, about vaccines, about international travel, VTL, everything else, those are pretty amazing uh, sets of uh, uh, infographics and uh, data storytelling that's, that highlights, right? So you know that um, the Singapore's, Singapore has an intent that, that we will live with COVID as an endemic, uh, as an endemic uh, virus, right? Same way, the same way we live with influenza, the same way we live with dengue, right? So because of that, the data that's being presented is going to be one that supports this position, right? The, so we worry much more around the, the the usage of ICUs and things like this, rather than about rather than about absolute numbers here and there, correct? So that's basically the first grad cert. All right, if I, I see uh, from Ray that we actually have a, a question. Uh, is it possible to use relevant modules from other departments, the NUS School of Computing? Uh, yes and no. Um, we have allowed um, we have allowed some some uh, modules to substitute, but in most cases we, we find that um, uh, the ones from in fact SOC and us School of Computing and us uh, find that our our perspectives are very different. So the SOC ones are much more academic, right? We are much more practice oriented. So kind of like um, chalk and cheese, uh, they really don't mix. It kind of like, they don't, we don't mash like this, we mash like this. <laughs> we, we miss each other a lot. Uh, the ones where we, we do accept a lot of um, uh, substitution is where it's certification based. Right, so in our security grad cert in our software engineering degree, for example, uh, one of the courses is about the uh, CISSP, which is a security certification. And you have that certification from any, any of the providers uh, will accept it in, in lieu of, the, of taking the course with us. Right, so certification is a standard type of things that we accept quite easily. Um, we have also accepted, for example, um, uh, not just a course, but really um, prior experience. So I mentioned stats for business, right? In this APM grad cert, we also have stats bootcamp in the one that's hardcore data analytics techniques. Uh, we have students who have come and join our analytics master's degrees, a program, stackable program, and they actually have a uh, a degree in statistics, an undergraduate degree in statistics. A couple of them have master's degrees in statistics, actually. But stats in and of itself is different from business analytics, right? So if you already have an undergraduate degree in statistics, we waive we waive the stats bootcamp, obviously, right? But you still have to do the 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 practice module, right? In the practice module, uh, whether or not you skip the the component courses, right? The exam is on the whole grad cert. So you may skip this, this, this module, but the, the exam and the project will test all the concepts and the practice from every component course, whether you did it or not, will be tested in the final part, right? So um, some of the students who actually have background in that area still opt to go through the courses themselves just to make sure that they understand uh, in a certain sense the latest part of things right if you have a stats degree from 20 years ago it could be useful to learn a little bit more about tableau and some of the capabilities that that are that are available today's world yeah. is that hopefully that answers uh, raised question uh, Joel, oh, you have taken the MTech uh, uh, degree in software engineering. Congratulations. I hope you passed. <laughs> right. Anyway, welcome to an alumni. Uh, yes, of course, you can, you can, you can, we actually, we actually uh, really expect our students to come back. Uh, education is nonstop, right? Um, I, I mentioned at the beginning, I'm an AI guy, right? So I was an AI guy for way too long now, okay, 25 years more, more 25 plus 30 years of uh, machine learning and so on. And my, my area was natural language processing. But the biggest change in today's world, deep learning in natural language processing, work to vec that only came out in 2012, right, with the major applications in 2013. And BERT came out just a few years back, GPT-3 last year, GPT-4 next year, right? So um, the major 
uh, technology, the major uh, uh, techniques that really have been uh, this 10x, 100x um, uh, uh, impact on the field of natural language processing on text analytics has been in this last five, 10 years. So if I, if I just uh, rely on what I did 20 years ago, you know, I'll, be, I'll be obsolete. So one of the things about, about practice-based uh, practice -based and even research-oriented uh, lecturing and, and practitioners is that you always have to keep up to date, right? Which means continue learning. And we actually think that people who do a degree in software engineering, right, that's basically builds the plumbing. Now you can either do two things. One is the best AI developers start from being a solid software developer becomes an AI developer, right? Very, very uh, high demand for good AI developers today. Software developer become an AI developer. So come back and take courses from the MTech AI, the intelligent systems program. Right. If you are old enough to be in our, in our old SE, legacy SE, then it's basically uh, last time was what they called knowledge engineering, but this is a much more evolved version of KE. Uh, and the other lot of people we have is people who are in software engineering, who have been doing a lot of the data engineering aspects. So how do I get data from systems? How do I you know, extract data from, from say, uh, a SAP database? How do I actually build a platform to share this data, to harmonize? the data? How do I pull data from different organizations, from those outside my company? Uh, how do I get my, my data into my customers and vice versa? Uh, these people also, after a while, they think that, hey, you know, it's not, do I, why do I just work with the data layer? I also want to work with the business uh, aspects of it. And business analytics is really about the business. It's not about the data, right? Data is, uh, is the tools, is part of that, that resource that you use to answer business questions. So a natural progression from software engineering is actually into analytics, right? If you are doing a lot of the data part. So yes, uh, to answer Joel's question, uh, do come and sign up for the stackable courses for, for another MTech degree. Uh, if you're Singaporean, you will still get the subsidies. There's no double dip restrictions as MOE used to have. Uh, you will get the subsidies, 40% you're Singaporean, 20% for PR, right? It's still available there. Okay, Joel, hope that answers your question. Um, Violet, does NUS recognize online certificates from learning platforms such as Coursera? Um, at this point right now, we have worked with Coursera quite a fair bit. There are Coursera courses that will also cross with the NUS courses, so but not in ISS. Um, the main reason is because uh, it's not it's not because the courses are bad. ISS actually was one of the first NUS uh, departments or uh, academic units to actually use uh, Andrew Ng's uh, machine learning course as part of our curriculum. So we definitely recognized it uh, in that sense as part of the curriculum. The problem is that the assessment is not an NUS assessment. And because of that, um, uh, we normally would like to actually use our own assessments are, uh, in addition to the course. So the course content that you get from going online to Coursera and so on is then followed by our own uh, set of assessments. Uh, in today's world, um, today right now, uh, there are actually very few Coursera courses that do the same thing we do. Right, so we are actually quite intensive. In a three-day course, we would probably cover uh, something that half a dozen courses in Kosura would do. And uh, it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence, right? Because a lot of Kosura courses, uh, even at master's level, undergraduate level, are still taken from universities, are primarily academic. Yeah. So I never say, I don't say never, but for now, uh, we have not accepted any of them. Students have applied and asked. We have said uh, no. We, we don't remember, we are not doing this by modular credits. So other universities, uh, maybe other departments as well, will say, you know, you have to finish 40 modular credits to, to get your degree. And can this modular credits from somewhere else, Kosora and so, and so on count? Uh, well, uh, they're recognized in other places. ISS, because we are minimum viable product, uh, if you replace something, you are displacing something that's part of the minimum viable product. And it's very difficult to find a one-to-one -one correspondence, right? 
as I said before, if you have certification like CSSP, yes. Without that kind of uh, clear scope that's identical, then it's tough. But so uh, while, as I said, I don't say never, uh, the chances of us accepting it is very low. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Violet. Yep. Uh, so APMS, uh, that's not a course, that's the grad cert. So the APM grad cert, uh, Analytics Project Management uh, grad cert, uh, that's on our that's on our website, and that's I just put up the I just put up the oops did it appear? I think I typed the answer in right. Did you get it? Well, I hope so. Did you get it? I, I hope you did. Right. So anyway, it's on it's on the I, uh, ISS website. And in addition, I think Edgar Edgar will probably write to you directly, right? Uh, I think it was under answered. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. This was under answered. Yes. So um, under open is under answered, and uh, in the in the Q and A part, and you can go there. You can also write to us directly, uh, and Edgar will probably provide his uh, email later. You can ask us as well. But uh, all the information is on the website, and in fact, I have to I have to just give this disclaimer: the 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 final the final and accurate copy is always on our website, right? We follow whatever's said on our website. I mean, I may say the wrong things by mistake, I, and if, if I do that, I apologize. Uh, but we will follow whatever's on our website. Okay. Any other questions? So uh, if no questions, I'll just, I'll, I'll let me just, uh, we have a few more minutes, just let me mention. So the first grad cert, as I said, is on analytics project management. It's open to everybody with or without a, a tech degree. The second fundamental grad cert is called uh, uh, analytics uh, techniques, right? Uh, uh, practice. And this grad cert is really to set you up to do business analytics. And we start off with Stats Bootcamp. And Stats Bootcamp is now a five-day course where you learn quite intensively R um, to, and also a bit of, I I'm, I'm, can't remember now, uh, do you? No, I think just, yeah, it's, it's mostly in R only, but you learn a lot more about R libraries as well. And uh, people always ask me, why R, why not Python, why more other things? But what we do is that grad cert by grad cert will use the the language and tools most appropriate for the grad cert. So the first grad cert is meant for people who don't have hard tech. So yeah, Excel is great for them. So we'll use Excel. The second one is for data scientists in the making. And we use R because R is a language for exploration. If you think of, uh, if you compare a helicopter to a aeroplane, for example, a cargo plane, if you were a reporter, uh, going to look at a fire um, in Indonesia, for example. If you go on an aeroplane, you zoom by it very fast and you can't do anything. If you go in a helicopter, you can stop, hover, go up, go down, circle it a few times, take lots of photos, you know, land, ask people questions, run away. Uh, it's for an exploration. You want to explore something, you use a helicopter. If I want to transfer cargo really fast and really far, I use a 747 and you know, to fly to San Francisco. And R is exactly the same thing. R is like a helicopter. It's there for you to explore the data and understand the business and the data questions that you have, right? The more you understand the data, you understand the business. The more you understand the business, you get insights in your data and R helps you do that. If you're going to then write a production system that will say, do the analytics automatically on a day by day basis, then by all means, use Java, use, uh, you know, use Python, Go, whatever you want to use. But R is the language for analytics, for analyzing. So that first, uh, the second grad cert, the, the, um, the analytics techniques grad cert starts with uh, the stats bootcamp and learning R as well. And that's basically statics. And then we move on to predictive analytics, PA. PA, predictive analytics is basically building models. All right, so that's the second part, and that's where you be build models in R, right? Then we go through uh, analytic, analytics, uh, data analytics best practice, and uh, processes and best practices, which is basically teach you the end-to-end -end process, and then we move on to do uh, text analytics. And text analytics is basically uh, text, but text is different from 
uh, numeric data in, in tables because you tend to have uh, streaming data, right? You have unstructured and streaming data as we call it, right? As well as converting from, from say uh, words into numbers, taking a paragraph of, or taking, a, taking the, the, the output from social media and how do you actually put this, how do you get social media data and stick it into a table to analyze, right? Things like this. So that's basically the first four. Uh, those are the four causes in the second grad cert. Yeah? And then the next grad certs after that are specialized areas. So we have a customer a CRM, a customer, uh, not, not CRM, sorry, uh, customer analytics, advanced customer analytics, and then campaign management. So those are for people primarily doing uh, customer analytics. And then we have one in big data. We have one in uh, what we call practical language processing because it's a, there is a very huge uh, demand in industry for people who are able to use uh, all the natural language processing techniques, right? That's the, last, uh, that's the third one. And then the last one is called uh, specialized predictive modeling and forecasting. And that does things like survival analysis, conjoint analysis. Uh, so an example of that would, would be epidemiology. Right, so the, the the models that we build for survivors, uh, for 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 COVID nineteen epidemics, for example, uh, is the techniques that will come in that last in that last um, uh, grad cert. Uh, not just for obviously not just for health analytics, uh, very much so also about running your business. Right, will your your business survive? Uh, am I hitting the right customer? Is my product the correct product? Uh, um, and finding the right features when customers have to find the correct fit of product and, and customer fit in the market. So that's that's basically the last grad cert. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, um, analytics is not purely for making things more efficient, right? That's what you will, that's what most people think of analytics is faster, better, and cheaper, right? Uh, at the end of the day, there you also want analytics to make your business thrive. Right, and that last grad is designed to making for for you to use analytics to make money in the company. Okay, so um, I think that's uh, I'm pretty much done. So uh, there there are no more questions. So I'd like to hand it back to Tammy, and I'd like to thank all of you for for hanging on for for like ramble on for so long. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Leong and Brandon, for your time and for your sharing today. We hope you've enjoyed today's session, and we'll now invite you to participate in our feedback poll. Please give us your honest feedback so that we can further improve on our brown bag series. The feedback poll should be popping up on your screen, so please take a few moments to share with us your observations. Thank you for your feedback and for joining us today. This Brown Bag series is proudly brought to you by Hithunt in partnership with NUS ISS. Please join us tomorrow on the topic of Real-Time Video Analytics by ISS. Please sign up early on our website, masterclass.sg. Thank you very much and we hope to see you tomorrow. Bye.